I want to preach this morning on following Jesus. I had something else last night, but this morning I got up and this was just constantly on my, on my mind. And so I want to preach this morning just simply on following, following Jesus. Um, we're going to look, um, of course our text will come from um, verse number 19. We're going to start back with verse number 18 in Matthew 4. And the Bible says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Of course, if you look throughout the Bible, you'll find that phrase comes up over and over where Jesus walks up to somebody. And of course, this is how he called out his, his 12 apostles. And he just simply walked up to them and said, follow me, follow me, follow me. Now, whether you realize it or not, at the, at the day that Christ called you to salvation, that's what he was saying to you, follow me. I mean, the, the idea of him becoming Savior, the Savior was just the beginning part. When you got him as Savior... You got him as Lord, you got him as King, you got him as your high priest, you got him as the Alpha and the Omega, you got him as the beginning and the end, you got him as the Almighty God. You didn't understand that at that moment. Uh, I'm a Lordship man, and uh, I believe that doesn't mean that I believe you live a sinless life. The Bible says a man that saith he hath not sinned uh, makes God a liar. In other words, he calls God a liar. But the Bible says if we confess our sins, He's just and faithful to forgive us. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all unrighteousness. And so, but, but the idea is, is that when, we, when, we, when we're born again, we're born again to something. God never pulls you out unless God is going to take you to. So, in other words, God brought the, the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, but He brought them out of bondage to take them to the promised land. And the idea is that God, that some, some people have this idea that God just brought us out. Well, God didn't just bring us out. God brought us out so that God might lead us too. So God always has a life for the child of God. He always has us a direction for us to go. He always has a purpose for us. He always has an end result is what God has for us. God never just saves us just for us to be saved. And, and we, get, we have that mentality. I think that started in the 20th century that we have this mentality that, that uh, we just got saved, we're saved, we're secured, and we're going to heaven. And I want to I share this with you. Of course, I certainly do believe in the strong security of the believer. But you ought to live your life. As a child of God, you ought to live your life like you could die and go to hell any minute. Now, let me rephrase that. You ought to live it like you could lose it. Because one of the most horrible things, and listen to me carefully, I do love the doctrine of the security of a believer. I love the doctrine to being secured in Christ, having full assurance. That is a wonderful, wonderful thing. But in today's society, in today's church, we are so carnal and we are so worldly and we have so many things dragging us down that we, we, we have this sense of a false security of leaning upon that doctrine. And so what happens is, is we wind up with too many Baptists who don't live good lives, who don't live moral lives, who don't live godly lives, who don't have a life for repentance. And I still say this, if you ever repent one time, you're going to keep on repenting. Yes, if you ever truly repent, you'll keep on repenting. Somebody's all people ask me this all the time. I, of course, I'm always saying about my sins that I have to constantly be confessing sins, sins of thought, sins of sins of uh, words, sins of, of deeds, and um, and if you're if you're that way, you, you do the same thing. So if you ever repent one time, you're just going to keep on repenting. Why? Because God's done something in you. Greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. God's done something in you. Sin bothers you. Now I don't know about you. But sin bothers me. And I've been in sin. I'll get in sin again. It eats at me. It eats my crawl. It bothers my conscience. I've got, lost my mind completely flipped over because of sin. Sin will do that to you. The child of God cannot stay in sin. Now, the, the old doctrines was this. The old doctrines was the, the old timers come up to you and they ask you this. Brother, are you persevering? Are you persevering? Now, we like the part of preservation. But the opposite of that is persevering. Now, we're not persevering so that in the end we'll be saved. 
But we are persevering because that God's preserved us. In other words, God's not going to let you go when you're his. Now what God desires of us, God desires of us to follow him. And, and there's certain things that I, I want to share this morning. Number one, God's not going to stop you from sinning. I've learned that the hard way. God will not stop you from sinning. I want to, I want to just drive this brainwash it in your mind. Maxwell House Coffee is good to what? You've been brainwashed. It's not. <laughs> I want to get this in your mind. God will not stop you from getting in sin. He's just not going to do it. Now, now he can. There may have been cases that he did. But we have this idea that God's going to put some, something out there and say, no, I'm not going to let you do that. That's generally not the case. He hadn't done that in my life. He didn't do it in David's life. He didn't do it in Peter's life. He didn't do it in Samson's life. He didn't do it in Abraham's life. My goodness, you look down through the, the great patriarchs. He didn't do it in their life. He didn't do it in the children of Noah's life. He didn't do it with the children of Israel. God wants us to live for him by choice. God wants us to walk with him by choice. God wants us to love loving him. And so God will let you go so far, enough, far enough to where God has to, God will chasten you. And I promise you this, I promise you this, when God chastens you, you won't have to ask if God is chastening you. Yeah, right. You know, I don't know about your mom and daddy. Mama whipped me with switches. Daddy whipped me with a belt. We wore nothing but cut off shorts back then. And uh, you think, you know, you, you think a little frail woman there couldn't do much to you. Mama could take a switch this long, I mean this big around, and she could work it on your legs until you would scream and you'd be red slicks up and down. I never one time had to turn around and say, Mama, are you whipping me? I never had, I never had to ask her, Mama, have you started yet? I never, had to, I never turned around and looked at my dad and said, Ow. Oh no, it was scream time for Don Neese. Now I may have went overboard a little bit, I'm a little extra. But anyhow, so, so I never have, you'll never have to ask God, God, is this you chastening me? Yeah, right. You're never going to wonder when God chastises his children. You'll never, and you have to understand this, it's not that God is punishing you. That the word is not punished there. The word is to chastise, to correct you. What God is trying to do is get you back on the path that God put you on to begin with. This is where God has a path for every child of God to walk. One of the great proofs of being a child of God is the Lord chastens those whom he loves. If you can get by with sin, it may be that you're not the child of God. God will chastise his children. The Bible says as a man chastises his son, God will chastise you. And the chastisement will be so great, you, you won't have to ask if this is the hand of God. Do you remember when David committed the great sin with Bathsheba? Killed her husband to cover up his sin. And, and the Bible says this, when Nathan the prophet came, he told young David, oh, not young David, he was 50 years old. He told David, he, he said, David, God has forgiven you, but the child must die. The child is going to die. And here is David weeping and crying. So let me ask you a question. While God was chastising and correcting David, do you think there was any question in David's mind who it was? No question. Number one, God told him who it was. Number two, he felt it. And he felt it the rest of his life. So here is God desiring us right off the bat. Here's what he says. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Now, when, when we come to the Lord Jesus as Savior, he, he, he looks at us and he says this, I want you to follow me. You follow my example. You follow my walk. My commands I give to you, I want you to follow them. But you follow me. This is what he wants from us. He wants us to follow him. And, and so here we start off on this journey. Now, I don't know what it was like you, for you. But when I got saved, when I was born again, when Jesus became my Lord and my King, I wanted to follow him. And it wasn't just that I wanted to follow where he had been. I wanted to follow him closely. I wanted to hold his hand. I mean, I wanted up near to him. I didn't want to have to follow his steps. I wanted to be able to keep him in my eyesight and follow him. 
But it's like we've been reading on Wednesday night Pilgrim's Progress and all, all the distractions that poor Pilgrim faces. And, 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 and he sees this. He goes to Vanity Fair. We read Wednesday night. And all the distractions and everybody trying to pull him. In life, everything in this world, every material subject, every carnal idea, the ideologies, the, the, the politics, everything in this world, even things that are clean, are trying constantly to pull us away from following him. And the whole thing about Christianity is following Jesus. I like to ask people now, instead of walking up to folks and asking them, hey, are you saved? Hey, have you been born again? I like to look at people now and I'll ask them this question. Are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? Amen. That takes them back. Are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? And here's what I get most of the time now. When I used to ask people, hey, have you ever been born again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, are you saved? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But now when I ask them, are you a servant of the Lord Jesus? That takes them back. And I believe it's one in the same. Now they're sitting back and they're saying, well, I don't know if I really follow him that close or not. And then, then the next question, well, are you following him at all? And that makes them think. That makes them think, are you serving the Lord Jesus? Are you following the Lord Jesus? So here's what happened. When a child of God gets saved, when they come and they're born again, when, when, when Jesus becomes their Lord, their King, their Almighty God, the, the first thing that ought to happen is we ought to start following Him. So whatever He's done, whatever He said, that's what we're supposed to do. Just pick up and follow Him. So where does He go? Well, the first place he leads us, I mean, when you see Jesus starting his ministry, the first thing he did, he went to God's man. He went to John the Baptist, did he not? And he went to John the Baptist, and here he said, John, it's time for me to be baptized. That's what he said. And John looked at him, he said, oh, but I, I need to be baptized of thee. And Jesus, paraphrasing this, he corrected John. He said, no, this is your job. My ministry is about to start. So before he ever had a ministry, the first thing he had to do was, the first thing he did was get baptized. Do you realize the first thing that Jesus asked of us after we become born again is to go into that baptismal pool or that baptismal water, bury that old man up underneath the water and rise up and say, I'm going to live a brand new life for the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that's the first thing that he wants from us. So if we're going to follow him, we cannot, we cannot bypass the baptism. We can't bypass that. This is part of following him. Everything that goes around that's a moot point because we must follow him into the baptismal pool. We must bury the old man and bring forth the new man and let him live for the Lord Jesus. Does that make sense to you? And so here, here is he follows, he follows, he follows. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us following him as they followed him. And then we look at his life. He begins to walk his life. We see him at the Lord's Supper. He wants us following him, partaking of the Lord's Supper. He wants us following him. I mean, when you ask people, are you a follower of Jesus? I have to ask them this. If you're a follower of Jesus, what well, did you follow him to church? Now, let's just pause right here. Can we pause here for just a minute? So here is the Lord, it's a New Testament command not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And I hear this all the time. Well, but Don, I don't believe you have to go to church to be saved. Really? Really? I don't believe you do either. Well, I believe you will once he gets inside of you. Once he becomes your Lord, you'll want to follow him. And you cannot follow the Lord Jesus Christ without following him. I mean, I use this all the time. Uh, Miss Tina's here. Miss Tina, raise your hand. Where, where's your atmosphere? I saw her come in. Raise your hand. I see. There. Okay, there she is. She's hiding from me. So, Miss Tina, here, here she is. Miss, Miss Tina, you know, what, what if I looked at her and I said, Miss Tina, boy, I love your head, but I hate your body. <laughs> that ain't going to go home too good, is it? Why don't you, some of you men, try that when you get home? Huh? Or some of you wives say, man, I love your body, but boy, I hate your face. I mean, you can't separate the head from the body. Can you? You cut the head off, the body dies. Jesus is the head of the church, and the Bible says the church is his body. I understand we have problems. My body's got problems. You understand that? You see that? It's got problems. It doesn't heal like it used to. Things hang on like it. Th 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 things that hurt hang on. But, but here, just because the body has problems doesn't mean we're, we, don't, we, we get rid of it. 
So here is the Lord saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. You can't be in love with the head and hate the body. And so if you're going to follow Jesus, here's this New Testament, New Testament commandment. You must follow him. Well, if, you, if you're following him, you'll follow him to church. So when you have folks that never have church life, they don't have any part of a church, they're not following him. You must follow, you must follow, you must follow. But then let's look further. Let's look where he went. Do you realize that Jesus, I mean, you look at him along the Sea of Galilee, you, you look at him um, in, in Gadara. You, you look at him among the lepers. You look at him beside the, 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 the well in Samaria. You look at everywhere that Jesus went from his birth in Bethlehem to his crucifixion uh, upon Golgotha's hill. You look everywhere he walked, every place he went, even when he said this, I must needs go through Samaria. He had the Samaritan woman in, in mind. If you look at his life, and the pattern that he walked, you think, you think this, that he just sporadically went wherever he wanted to go. Oh, I think I'll go here today, and I think I'll go here today. But it wasn't like that. Jesus never did anything unless it was planned ahead of time. It was a chess game. You understand that? Every place he went was a place that was strategically laid out, not by him, but by his father. And he made that statement. He, he, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't heal all the lepers? I mean, he could have. Why didn't all the cripples get up and walk? How come all the blind in Israel didn't see? I mean, he walks up to the pool of Bethesda, and it's, the Bible says it's surrounded by hundreds of people, and they're lame, and they're blind, and they're halt, and, and, and they're crippled up, the Bible says. But he only went up there and healed that one man. Why? Why not everybody? Could he have healed everybody? Well, why not everybody? Because everything he did was this. He said, I must needs be about my father's business. Remember when he was 12 years old and he, his parents left? And he was gone for three days. They didn't find him. And they found him in the temple, in the synagogues. They found him with all the scholars. And he was asking them questions and answering their questions. And, and Mary came and found him as a young boy, 12 years old. And she said, don't you know that me and your father have been worried about you? And he said, I must needs be about my father's business. Everywhere that Jesus went, every miracle he ever performed was because that was where his father was working. And he said, I must needs go where my father goes. So everywhere that Jesus walked, every miracle that he did, he could look and see this was where his father wanted him, even to the death. In his, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he knelt down and he prayed. And, and, and as he prayed, there were great drops of perspiration came out of his skin and, and he perspired as though it were blood. And I believe it was real blood coming out. In agony, he began to pray. And here's what he prayed. Father, let this cup pass from me if it be thy will. But if not, then I'll drink him. In other words, before he was going to go to Calvary and down the cross, he was going to make absolutely 100% sure this was where his father wanted him to go. Nothing was random with him. And so everything he did, he, was, he put himself underneath the authority of his father, not a rebellious son. When he went to Calvary, he was performing his father's will, paying for the sins of the world. So when we look at his life, his life was not a life of just going where he thought he ought to go or doing what he wanted to do or healing who he wanted to heal. There was a plan behind it. And, and, and it was his father's plan. And he carried out that plan perfectly so much to the point, to the T, that the father from heaven cried out and said this, this is my son in whom I'm what? I'm well pleased with him. I'm happy with him. He's done perfect. I'm well pleased. He satisfied me completely. He satisfied the law completely. He's done everything wonderful just the way I wanted it done. He has erred in no place. He has not missed one point. Every place I told him to go, everything I guided him to do, that's what he's done. And here's what Peter says to you and I. Peter says, just as Jesus did that with Father, that we ought to follow in his steps, in the steps of the Savior. Now, if you want to have a victorious Christian life, if you want to really want to be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us, then we have to follow him. 
And what that means is we have to realize when we've deviated. Now, has anybody deviated this week? Well, come on, help me out. Yes, Amen. Y'all really live that good? Yes, I cannot tell you how many times I've deviated this week. The whole idea of the Christian walk is when, when you have deviated, God will get your attention that you've deviated and he wants you back on track. Now, let's picture this. Here's the way it starts off. In reality, we start off like this. We start off, the Lord comes to us, and it really, really at the point of salvation, he is saying, follow me. That's really what he's saying. You follow me, believe on me, follow me. And we get up, and we are so glad to follow him. It's like the sky is bluer, and the green is greener, and the trees are sweeter, and everything's just better. Just like that, everything was just better. You know, and so you began to follow him, but you're close to him. It's like you reached up there and grabbed the hem of his garment, and you've got a hold of it, and you're following him. I mean, that's, that's how it is. You, you're just that close to him. When, when you pray, it's like you have the hem of his garment. When you worship, it's like you, he's sitting beside you. And, and, and it, when you read the Bible, it's almost like he's reading it to you. You're near to him. That's what it was like when, when, when it was fresh and it was alive because he was near to you. Do you remember the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Peter drew the sword? I mean, here's a great multitude. The, the, the Bible tells us it was a riotous crowd. They came out. And they're in the thousands, by the way. And Peter draws that sword. He's got one sword. And Peter draws that one sword. One sword against thousands with sticks and staves draws that one sword. And he cuts the ear off of Malchus's servant. Remember that? He cuts the ear off. You realize he wasn't aiming for the ear? He was aiming for the head. He was going to take the man's head off. And so he swings the sword, and undoubtedly what happens is the man tilts his head, and Peter takes off the ear. Jesus picks it up and puts it back on the man's head. But he was swinging for his head. My, my thing is, there's no way Peter could defeat those thousands, even with one sword. But he was standing beside the Lord. And he knew this, with the Lord beside me, I can defeat anybody. I don't care how big the crowd is. But he was that close with the Lord. Now what's amazing, it didn't take but just a, a, a 24 hours and he's denying him. He's de that's how we are. We're no different. Just like we, we deviate just that fast. But, but when he's beside him, he's afraid of nothing. He can overcome nothing. Now here's what God is asking us today. Don't worry about what the White House is doing. Don't worry about what's going on with Putin. I think Putin and Ukraine, I think, I think Biden, I think they're all in it together. I think they're all a bunch of crooks, a bunch of communists. That's my opinion. And so here they are. I believe, I believe it's all satanic. I don't have to say I believe it. I know it is. But, but here's what the Lord is telling us. Don't you worry about that. You follow me. I made this world. I can handle them. I can handle this. I, I can handle all this. Now let me pause right here and just tell you something. Have you ever thought about this? Now, if the Lord's about to come tomorrow, and I think he's coming in the next couple of years, that's what I think, maybe in the next three and a half, seven, I don't know, but I believe he's coming soon. Yep. So just stop and think about this. Think about all the political stuff you worried about, that, that we worried about, the borders. Who's coming across the borders? Who's doing this and who's doing that? And the wars and the rumors of wars. Now stop and think about this. If the Lord is going to come in three and a half years or in the next seven years, what will all that matter? Now stop and think about, just stop and think about this. Everybody coming across these borders, from, a, from an American's point of view, it's a horrible thing, is it not? It's going it's to destroy the country. But from a child of God's point of view, God, it may be that God is wanting you and I to reach these people with the gospel because they're not hearing it where they're at. Have you thought about that? I've got a young missionary I'm fixing to have come in here uh, the next few Wednesday nights, and he started a brand new ministry. They're going to the port of, uh, of Mobile on, on the ships that are coming in that, that have um, people from uh, foreign, foreign uh, countries that work there, and, and they've got permission to go on the ships and share the gospel with them. And I'm thinking, there's a foreign mission right here in, in, our, in one of our port cities. I never heard of anything like that. Man, what a great idea. And I told him, I said, yeah, we, we want to get involved in this. I want to hear more about it. So I'm going to have him in, in a couple of Wednesday nights. The Lord may just be opening the door to get the gospel to more people. So regardless who it is, you need to follow Jesus in, in, in the act of telling them about Jesus. It is more important for us to follow him now than ever. Now, now picture this. Picture that the Lord is, is walking along. And the problem is that sometime down the road, either he 
either he got ahead of us, got faster than us, or we didn't keep up, we got distracted, somehow or another, you let go of the hem of the garment. And you did. That's just the way life goes. I'd, I'd like to say that, you know, I never let go of the hem of the garment. But sooner or later, you have to cut the umbilical cord. And I think God cuts it because God wants us to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. And so as long as, we're, long as we have him right here, we're not walking by faith, we're walking by sight. But there comes a place, the child of God, God has to bring us to a place where, we cut that, where he cuts that umbilical cord and he says, now you're not going to see me, but you're going to have to walk by faith. And that's what God commands us. So now we have to walk by faith because we're not seeing him anymore. Right. I mean, that is what he asked for us to do. I want you to walk by faith. I want you to trust me in what I'm doing and I want you to follow my steps. Now here we go. So we've gone from following him, holding on to the hem of his garment and watching him to the place that we're now. We're walking along and we're watching where he stepped. This is how God grows us. And so now we're walking in his steps, but we can see his steps in the sand, so it's okay. We can follow him. And then it's not long. If he walks across a muddy place, a clay place, we can see him. We can follow him. But it's just a matter of time before a storm comes. Everybody gets them. And the steps aren't there anymore. And you can't see the prints in the sand no more. Or the prints in the mud. Because the storm has come and washed it all away. And you have no idea which direction to go. How many of y'all have been lost at night? I mean, never, that's all. Boy, I have. Anybody ever been lost in the Gulf of Mexico at night? Don't know which way to go. I, I can remember being lost in the Gulf of Mexico when the thick, thick fog came in with no instruments, not knowing which way to go. Scary. It's scary. All you can do is sit there and wait for the fog to burn, hope you can see land, and hope a tugboat or a ship or another vessel doesn't run over you while you're sitting there. But sooner or later, it's, it's, not, it's not a question of when, it's a question of if. The old pilot, the old pilot my old a flight instructor, he was a World War II pilot, and he was teaching me how to fly, and every time he would tell me this, he would say, son, it's not a question of if you're going to ever lose your engine, it's a question of when you're going to lose it. And the day came, it happened. It's, the, the day is going to come, something's going to happen. So every time you went up, we went through emergency procedures. And that day I'm flying along and that engine is purring along real good. And it goes, whoom, and she's gone. Immediately I go down and start going through emergency procedures. Just It, it became memory. And of course in just a few minutes, the plane, plane had already gone down about 500 feet. And uh, the engine went, whoom. Dad was not so lucky. His didn't go, whoom. His, his went down all the way. But, but here, here you are. It will happen. In the walk of the child of God, the storm will come. The night will come. Something is going to happen. You will not see him. You will not see his steps. You will be in complete darkness in the valley of the shadow of death. That's where you will be at. So what do you do then? The wonderful thing about God is God will never let you get there till God knows you can get through it. But God will test you to see if you're going to get through it. How do you get through it? You believe in him. You trust in him. You, 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 you go the direction that God wants you to go. And when you don't know what to do, here's what God says. Stand still that thou may knowest that I am the God. Sometimes you just stop. And you stand still. That's what he told Moses to do at, at the Red Sea. Stand still and know that I am God. There are times you just stand still. God will burn the fog off. God will do this. God will do something. But God will come through every single time. Now let me, let me help you here. I have been there when I cried out to the heavens, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you at? Couldn't feel God. Couldn't sense God. Couldn't see God. Uh, just, just every question, every doubt in my mind was there screaming at God, where are you at? God did come through. Amen. Has anybody ever been there where you thought God was gone, but then God was already there? Anybody raise your hand? Just raise. See, there have been people. We've been there, and God did come through, and God always will. But following Jesus steps following him 
It's something that he, he requires of us. It's not a request. It is to follow him. And, and when we have deviated off the trail, God will help bring us back every single time. But God desires us to follow him, to follow him, to follow him, and to follow him. I want you to notice what these guys did. Every single person that ever followed Jesus, you'll find that. The woman at the well, she left her pot. She went and did what he told them to do. The apostles, these disciples, he just met them. They left their nets and they followed him. Every single time there's something that you're going to drop down and you're going to follow him. In other words, this is not important anymore. Following him is what's important. And so your whole life as a Christian, what's happening is there's going to be deviations. There's going to be distractions. Something's going to come along. Everything is trying to stop us from following him. In the days that are coming... In the days that are coming, the most important thing that you can do is follow him. And the most horrible thing is for the child of God, we want to follow something else. Yes, Satan's doing everything he can, the world, family, friends, anybody, anything, to get us to follow someplace else. Listen to me. This is where God put me. Almost 30 years ago, this is where God has put me. And there has never ceased to be a time that something wasn't trying to take me away from this spot right here. For 30 years, everything. And, 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 and I look and I see the work that God is doing. And I see people coming to Christ. And I see people, you, you, you know, you, you think it's not making the difference. But this is where God put me. And so when I'm looking now, there's a deviation. Something is constantly trying to distract me and pull me away from where God put me. And you have to look at that in your life. If this is where God puts you, this is where you ought to work. If God has you on a path, stay on that path and don't deviate until you know for a fact it's God. Until you know for a fact. Not that you thought it. Not that you felt it, but to you know for a fact. Some young preacher told me a while back he was thinking about going and doing this, some work for God somewhere. And I said, man, that's mighty iffy. That's mighty iffy. And I'm not God, so I wasn't going to tell him to or not, but I said this. And I've said it to a hundred young preachers. I believe I'd get God to give me a handwritten letter before I'd stop off and do that. <laughs> In other words, what I meant by that is that there can be no doubt because what you're going to do, you're going to step off and get out of God's will. And that's a dangerous thing. That's, ask Samson. Ask me. Ask David. Ask young Peter. Ask all those, all, some of those old patriarchs, patriarchs how dangerous it is to step off on a whim. No, sir, don't do that. You stay rock. You stay solid. You follow him. Everything is trying to take away his, 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 his steps, his sight. But we walk by faith. And the further you're in it, look, it took me a long time to learn this. When I was a young preacher, God spoke to me a lot. I mean a lot. I'd get up and I'd say, boy, God told me this. And God did tell me that. By the Holy Spirit, God speaks to you in several different ways. Any way he wants to. But normally God will speak to you, number one, by his word. Number two, by his spirit. Uh, number three, by circumstances. So, so that's the three ways that God mostly will speak to you. Now, the problem is, is when we take the word. You know, it's kind of like um, that guy that was thinking about committing suicide. He's going to, you know, he's going to, he was just thinking about it, you know. And so he took his Bible and he flipped it open. And uh, he looked at that verse, pointed his finger down there. Now, if you've ever done this trying to figure out what God wants you to do, don't do this. Flipped the Bible open, pulled the verse, and it said, uh, it, it looked at it and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> he said, oh, I better not do that. And so he, he, he flipped it over and he pointed it down again and looked at it and he said, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> you know, that may not be the best way to get something from God. <laughs> you understand? And so you take the Word of God and you rightly divide it. You don't just take some Bible verse and say, well, it said this and apply it to what you're doing. No, you rightly divide the Word of God. This, will never, this, this is your map. This will never lead you astray. When you cannot hold, when you are not holding the hem of his garment, when you can no longer see his steps in the sand, I want you to know that God has left us a map, a book of instructions. If we stay in the boundaries of the word of this of the words of this map and these instructions, we will not go wrong. It's when we step out, and we do step out. We do step out. Now, here's what happens when we step out. I want you to listen to this real carefully. 
it's, it's like going down I-10. There's no U-turn. You realize you, you, I'm, on, I'm, I'm going the wrong way. Have you ever done that past your exit and you're going the wrong way? You're not going to make a U-turn. You have to go all, you have to ride it out. There's nothing you can do, you have to go all the way. My Aunt Faye used to sing a song, ride out your storm. You got to go all the way to the next exit and sometimes that's 20 miles. You got, you, got, you got to stay there, but then you get, God will provide you a place, but you have to ride it out. You have to be willing to ride it out. And then, not only that, you've got to come back. And sometimes you've got to go past your other exit to get to another exit to turn around because there's not an off right there. That has happened to me more than once. In other words, it can be difficult to get back to where you were supposed to be, but you can get back to where you were supposed to be. Some of us take the hard way. Some of us take the easy way. Some of us take the right way. God, won't, God will get you where you need to be. But when you get there, this will never lead you astray. Now, you can look at it wrongly, and that will take you astray. You can't make it say what you want it to say. You have to let it say what God says. And the Bible says there's safety in the multitude of counselors. Find some people, find some people that are walking with God and get them to help you walk with God. Now, then number two, the Spirit. Always the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will never lead you astray, but this gets really dangerous. I'll close here in a minute, but you, you need to listen to this. The Holy Spirit will never lead you astray, but I want to tell you that Satan's voice can make you think he's the voice of of God. Very easy. You can never trust your heart. You can never trust your feelings. Your feelings, your heart will lie to you. The Bible says the heart is exceedingly deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Your heart is a liar. The heart lies. Lie! lie, lie. Everybody say that. <laughs> It'll lie to you every time. The heart's a liar. It lies. It lies. How many young girls have you seen make this statement? They look at, look at some rough guy, some bad guy, and they say, oh, I can, I can straighten him up. Lie. <laughs> Lie. <laughs> she did it, huh? Lie. God, God might have. There are miracles. You know. <laughs> you know? Oh, I can, I, can, I can just do this for a little while, then I'll quit. Lie. Well, I can, I can straighten this out. Lie. The heart lies. You, you believe it so much. You want it so much that you believe it, but you can't. Satan is a liar. Jesus said that, and he will lie. He will lie to you. Then circumstances. How many times? I mean, I, you know, as a pastor, I hear this all the time. I woke up this morning, Brother Don, I've been asking God for a sign, and I saw a butterfly fly across the sky, and I, I think God spoke to me and told me I should fly uh, to New York. I don't know. I hear stuff. I'm telling you, you just don't understand the people I hear. No. No. But God will use circumstances. In other, way, in other words, God will, God will hem you in sometimes to where you have no choice but to do this. God, God will do that. He will do that. But the best choice is just simply when you follow Him. The Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, is to follow Him. I have no, word, I have no idea where the world, I, I do have an idea, but I mean as far as day to day, I, I don't know what's about to happen and what's going on in our world today. It's, 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 it's unsure. It's unpredictable, except we do know this. We do know the whole world will go to a global system, which is happening. We do know the world's going to go to one monetary system, which is happening. We, we do know this. We do know the man of sin is coming, which is happening. We, we do know this. We do know that... Uh, there, there's going to be all. There's going to be these ten kingdoms that are going to rule the world. We do know that. We do know that one of the heads of that kingdom was going to be wounded to death. I say that's Germany. I've been saying for years that was Germany. People were laughing at me. They're not laughing anymore now that they see what Germany's doing. You look at a picture of Berlin after World War. Look at Germany. Pictures of Germany after World War II. It was devastated. It was this great head that was wounded to death by a sword. And the world would wonder that now it lives. And you look at Germany today. Germany now is in control of all the European Union. In control. What's going on in the Ukraine? You look at what Germany's doing. Look at what's going on in Syria. Look at what Germany's doing. Look at the ties with Germany and Israel now. You want to know what to watch? Keep your eye on Germany. Keep your eye on Germany. Germany, you look at Germany now. Germany's at the head. Germany's this great head that is running Europe now. Germany's back in charge. People, one thing we've learned about history, we don't learn anything about history. 
Winston Churchill wrote five big giant volumes on never take your eye off Germany. Germany's always been this way. Germany always wanted to be a world power. He warned us in our generation to not trust Germany. And here we are, Germany's back in charge. They don't have to have an army. They run the Europe, Europe's army. Whoever controls the money is in control. We have no idea which direction to go. Money, finances, anything right now. Nothing. Nothing. Except this. If we follow his steps, you'll be right every time. You follow him. Now here's the thing. I want to follow him right now. I followed him in baptism. I want to follow him in giving to the Lord. I want to follow him in being a model citizen. I've deviated enough. And so have you. But I want to follow him from this day forward. I want to follow him. I want to follow him when he comes and shouts and we go up and meet him in the air. I want to follow him. I want to be there. I want to follow him to heaven. I want to follow him back when he comes back and takes the planet back. I want to follow him. I'd like for Grace Valley to be a church that follows him. All that we do, we follow him. Now, I didn't say it was easy, but it's simple. Every day, all you have to do is follow him. If you're hot following him, we're going to be all right. He'll take care of everything, everything else. But if we deviate, that's where the trouble comes in. Just follow him, everything's okay. Simple, not easy. Simple. Anybody tells you living for Christ is easy, they never lived for him. They never lived for him. It's, th it's like this. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. That's what he said. That's the Christian life. You have to follow him. The determination between a Christian and a non-Christian, the Christian's following him. The non-Christian is not. Well, I'll ask you this morning. Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you following him? If not, would you like to follow him? I can tell you it's good when you follow him. Amen. Even, uh, I'm scared to say this, even the defeats are sweet. All well, the victories are wonderful. When I look back, even the defeats turned out sweet. How is that possible? Because I look back and see what God did with the defeats. Now, let me share this with you. I look back and see what God did with the defeats. Did you know the Bible says that all things work together for good? To those who love the Lord, that's good, that's bad, that's sin, that's righteous, that's everything. For the child of God, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to them who are the call, the call to come to, to, to His purpose. Even the defeats were sweet. Why? Because I look back now and see how God used it. I'm going to give you this example to prove that with a little bit of Bible. David's great sin, murder, adultery, pregnancy, trying to cover it up, the death of that child, the death of that child. But from that marriage, something horrible, something gross, something murderous, you'd think it was the end of the kingdom. No. From that marriage came a Solomon. A Solomon. And when you began to read about the greatness of Solomon, and from that kingdom came a perpetual kingdom that the king of kings came from. What I'm telling you, child of God, is even in your bad, even the times you deviated, somehow or another God can take that and use it for his glory. But only God does that. That doesn't give you an excuse to deviate. But I want you to know if you've deviated, even God can take that and make it something wonderful. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And we'll be okay. We'll eventually follow him all the way home. Let's stand up.